Hello everyone. I'm surprised so many people are sticking around. Uh, I know it's been a long day. I myself, uh, first time in Finland, first time at Slush. I'm uh, jet lagged. I'm from Silicon Valley, so it's 20 degrees colder, four less hours of sun, but I'm really energized. This is an amazing conference. I haven't seen something like this before. Uh, what really amazes me is the number of volunteers here. I would love to give a round of applause to all the volunteers who are making this a great success. You know, I, I've, I've been to many conferences. I've never been assigned a personal concierge. So I was assigned a personal concierge here. She was so nice and responsive that until I met her 15 minutes back, I actually thought she was an AI bot. Uh, but it turns out it's a real person, also a volunteer. Again, really, really good service. So I, I'm here. Uh, first of all, how many founders? Not many. Okay. Well, for the ones who are here, I'm here because I believe you have the best job in the world because you're actually changing it for the better. I have the second best job because I meet a number of you and I'm able to fund some of you and also provide help from a company like Microsoft. I will tell you one thing though. I have a request from the founders in the room. And what do I mean by this? In the last three months, I've been drowning in AI and machine learning. Why is that? Nowadays, every time I hear a pitch from a company, this is how it goes. I am powered by AI, born in the cloud, selling enterprise SaaS in an IoT platform. That's generally the pitch I get. What I would request is, we go back to first principles and everybody describes the hard problem you're solving with the killer team you put together. And really, the big market will open up if you solve the problem. If AI is useful in solving the hard problem, then that's fine. But if it's not, you don't need to put in AI just to get mentioned. We have personally, this, this year, Microsoft Ventures has funded 14 great teams. Over half of them don't use AI, or if they use it, they use publicly available APIs, and there is no problem. They are great teams that do well without having to use AI. So before we start on AI, I will go through, I would say, a short walk in time. Always good to look at the past and learn from it when you're looking for the future. So right here in Europe in 1450, the printing press was developed. That led to massive amounts of information access. If you think about it, there's a lot of media here today, a lot of authors. They all write about it. Nobody goes and says, I wrote this article and it was powered by a printing press. Nobody says that. And I would bet that none of the media here have a printing press at home. Because it's, it is generally available, accessible, and everybody can access the power of the printing press. We want to have AI get to the same level, but we are, it's taken a long time to get here, and it's still a long time to, to the point where everybody just believes AI is just part of daily life. So going back to 1956, uh, Professor John McCarthy from a college, uh, um, Dartmouth College organized a conference, uh, a summer research project. That was the first time the term AI was used. He got together with many professors who are all here and came together with a report that is amazing to read today. They had put forth all the general AI concepts that we know today, except that they were a few decades early. They truly believed that they could deliver on a lot of the concepts they had put together. It is a really, really good paper that you can read. It was written together with Cloud Shannon, the, the father of modern information theory, Marin Minsky, co-founder of the IT MIT labs, and Nathan Roberts from IBM. This is Marvin Minsky. In 1970, he famously said this, this quote. He said, in 
from three to eight years, we will have machines with the general intelligence of an average human being. He was also a few decades early. Now, of course, you can look back and say, depending your definition of average human intelligence or average human, he may have been right. Uh, what happened after that? There was a period of time when none of the predictions came true. AI was looked upon as almost a bad word. PhD students didn't want to major in AI. Nobody wanted to touch it because there was really no progress. There was too many predictions, no progress. Fast forward to 1989, Jan LeCun wrote a seminal paper where he used techniques to analyze handwritten zip codes from the US Postal Service. That forms the basis for what we all know as deep learning today. Now, fast forward more, in 1997, Deep Blue beat Kasparov. Everybody was, AI is back. Well, what happened was it turns out that the concepts used in Deep Blue were not generali generalizable. Also, it just turns out that computers are much better at evaluating billions of move on a chessboard. In 1997, another thing happened. Uh, it's, I'm trying to figure out if it's a younger crowd or not, but Microsoft introduced Clippy. Anybody heard of Clippy? Well, I was going to try to rewrite history and say Clippy was wildly successful, but I see that a lot of people are here, so they may know about that. Clippy was our version of the office assistant, was not wildly successful. History has not been very kind to Clippy although we keep bringing back to say what we shouldn't do. So there's been many, many attempts at AI that haven't really worked out. Fast forward again, 2012. Research at Google fed 10 million YouTube videos to the Google brain, and the Google brain made like a stunning conclusion. A stunning conclusion was that there are many cat videos in YouTube. Now, I'll tell you what, you may laugh at it because we already knew that. But they did not introduce the concept of a cat to the Google brain. It figured it out using the enormous amount of data that was fed to it. So that, it is really impressive that happened. Fast forward 2016, I have to mention Microsoft, historic achievement. We were able to reach human parity on conversation speech recognition. So, Today, in a certain way, all of the companies you see on this on the slide are using AI and machine learning. It's just not upfront or obvious about it, but they're all using it. It's no longer science fiction. Now, this slide has got nothing to do with AI. This is what Helsinki in spring looks like, so I want to come back. Uh, however, we also want to say that this is truly the spring of AI. I don't know personally if another winter is coming. I've heard through other sources that one is scheduled for the summer of 2017, unless Game of Thrones is delayed once again. But I think we are at the cusp of something that's new. You might ask, there's been 50 years of study, why has there been so much progress in the recent past? The reason there's been so much progress in the recent past is, if you look at the left side, the cost of hardware has gone down dramatically. Compute power has improved, networking has improved, and that has led to amazing amounts of wealth creation. Amazing amounts of wealth creation. The time these companies have taken to reach a billion dollars plus in valuation has compressed over time. You know, Uber's my, one of my favorite apps, Snapchat is one of my daughter's favorite apps, but what is common to all of that is low cost hardware, heavy computing, and then ubiquitous network access. This is, what is also going on is these sensors are producing immense amounts of data that was not available 50 years back. This data is then be fed to the AI models, and that is leading to a leap forward in AI. Because the more training data you have, the better the models and better the predictions. So really, that's what is happening. Having said that, we are not at the point today that anybody can just start writing a mobile app. So the way mobile apps revolutionized smartphones, we are not at the point in AI today. So what do you think is the equivalent? We need to solve that. If we solve that, 
that will lead to another cycle of wealth creation and will do good for humanity in many ways. So, but large, com good news is the large companies are spending massive amounts of R&D right now trying to fix the core building blocks for AI. Vision and speech are farthest along. Language is coming up. I think it's close behind. True knowledge will take some time. In addition to this, large companies are also building the computing fabric of tomorrow. What you see in front of you is the world's fastest AI supercomputer. It's called Azure. And the reason I bring this up is the capability of what you see on the screen today is one exaflops. That is a billion, billion operations per second. To put that in perspective, if we feed to this machine all of the English Wikipedia, that is five million articles and three billion words, and try to translate into another language, the time it takes this, this machine is less than a tenth of a second. Less than a tenth of a second to translate all of English Wikipedia. So net-net, large company R&D is solving these problems that will help ultimately provide access to AI for everybody. So what do startups do? If there ain't no startup opportunities left, not the case. Clearly, there will still be opportunities to help improve the computing fabric. There will be opportunities to help fix more of the core building blocks. But both of those require a lot more data and a lot more scale. So there is a little bit of a big company advantage. However, there is vast opportunities in applying AI to many verticals. And that's where we are seeing a lot of traction for startups. The first two verticals I'm showing are essentially information security or cybersecurity and data science. If you take those two professions today, both are facing what we would call negative unemployment. That is, there is a serious skill shortage in both those industries. AI is really good at solving that negative unemployment problem. Not taking away jobs, actually just solving skill shortage. The third example I really like, and that's despite if you've seen the movie, it's not that, but it's close enough. I want to talk about an example of Jill Watson. You say, who's Jill Watson? Jill Watson is an AI teaching assistant bot that was created by Georgia Tech professor Ashok Goel to help teach students or to help students of his online course on AI. So the students did not know until the end of the semester that they were talking to an AI TA. It was that good. If you think about it, it's a huge virtuous cycle there. By doing that, there's more people who can access online education on technical fields, hopefully AI, he was teaching an AI course, there'll be more people trained in AI that will then improve the AI TA bot that then basically leads to more people learning AI. So it's a really virtuous cycle. The last example is in medicine. In medicine, there is a chronic shortage of radiologists. In big health systems like the National Health System in the UK, or other big private, even big private health systems, many, many hundreds of scans are never taken a look at or they're delayed because there's a shortage of specialists. What AI can do is triage a number of these scans so only very few of them will be needed to be looked at by radiologists to make a diagnosis. Now, I could have given many, many more examples. The examples I chose, I think, a little bit deliberately, is to show that AI can definitely be good for business. But clearly, AI can be also used for the good of society. There are very, very good applications of AI that advance humanity. So having said that now, I will come to Microsoft. This is the only two Microsoft slides I have, so bear with me. So we have our mission. Our mission is to empower every person and every organization on the planet to achieve more. In the context of AI, what does that mean? We heavily promote diverse, inclusive development. That is a very key requirement for AI because the AI is going to affect consumers who are also diverse and inclusive. In addition, we have open sourced our cognitive toolkit or AI framework, and also we have teamed up with OpenAI 
to even further help democratize um, artificial intelligence. In addition to all of what I just said, I'm here representing Microsoft Ventures, so I'm helping fund companies that help achieve the objectives we've set out as a company. So really, Microsoft collectively is helping advance state-of-the-art in AI, help democratize it so that everybody can then access it, and then we won't be having to say we are carrying the printing press with us or we are powered by the printing press. We'll just say it works, and AI is in the background, invisible to all of that, and working on it. With that, I will end. Uh, thank you very much, and I'm, I apologize for the length of the presentation. One of my favorite quotes is by Oscar Wilde, who said, if I ha only had more time, I would have written a shorter letter. So I had to do this very quickly. That was the length of the presentation. Thank you very much. Enjoy the rest of the show.